This is a clip from the Canon Podcast. To hear the full episode and get access to exclusive benefits, head over to patreon.com forward slash the Canon Pod and sign up for just £3 a month. In terms of the forward department, there was a surprise against uh, Man City. Out of nowhere, everyone thought it would be Trossard and Ketia. Kai Havertz starting as a centre forward. And you know now there's a massive debate about what is his best role in this Arsenal team. And I think I was surprised by how complete he was in certain senses as a centre forward. His his movement, his presence, and you know the ability to hold the ball up, get other players into the game. Obviously, he should have scored a few goals, but to get into those positions is a good sign as well. What do you think in terms of Kai Havertz's best role in this Arsenal team? Where do you think it is? Well, I mean, I, I still have said kind of within the podcast, for me, he's a second striker type of profile he's in that kind of Thomas Muller type where he's not quite a 10 and he's not quite a striker for me and I think while he can play certain positions I don't think that he's best there like if I was trying to build a system around Kai Havertz what is his best position I would say again the tip of the diamond and I think the reason because I don't think that makes you a primary creator I don't think if you ask Kai Havertz to be the Martin Odegaard of the team you're going to see him thrive I think he needs freedom of movement you can't tell him to be in a specific position he doesn't thrive in that way he needs freedom across both sides of the pitch to kind of drop in and act as like a plus one or a facilitator to make to knitting kind of attacks together I think that's where he's best and of course you've got to give him the freedom of movement to kind of arrive and crash the box because I think movement is his best quality he is a space invader that is something that I think is his special quality if I had to define one thing it's recognizing where there's space in the back line and so in order to facilitate that and get that freedom truly maximized I don't want him kind of defending in a pivot and that's why I like the idea of a 3-4-3 diamond because he can join the press as one of front two. And I think what we saw, even as far as the Community Shield game, is how intelligent he is meeting markers and supporting the press. So he may not be, you know, the most complete tackler in the world. But one thing that I think he does really intelligently is fill in passing lanes and making sure to kind of support the press in a really smart way. I think he did that brilliantly over the weekend. So um, I think making sure that we keep that and making sure we keep that freedom of movement is something that I'm really um, critical when I talk about Kai Havertz in his best position. Do I think we see the diamond, though, again? We kind of talked about it earlier as a plan A. I'm not too sure, but for me, that's how I see him best. And I still think that we might see him in different cameo positions because we saw him as a striker. We might see him as a right wing. We might see him in midfield. I don't think Kai Havertz will have a set position, and Mm -hmm. that I think is okay. Mm-hmm. And I think there, you know, there are certain people on, on social media, especially on Twitter, that believe he can be transformed into a really top number nine because you see the profile physically, the six or four frame, decent turn of pace. What do you think Mikel Arteta's long-term plan is for Havertz? Because when you spend £65 million and you make that statement signing, because you're yeah. backing Kai Havertz, you're saying, listen, this is one of my most expensive ever signings, I think second most expensive signing, I'm making you one of my main players. There must be a long-term role for him in the first team. Is it as a number eight on the left-hand side? Is it as a proper number nine? Can he be transformed into a decent finisher? What do you think is Kai Havertz's long-term role in his team? Well, I've, I've definitely said that I think he can be transformed. Well, not even transformed. I think he is ultimately at his core a, a pretty good finisher. If you actually look at his career, the issue that you're having is you've got this sample of Chelsea where he's been used really wrong. And he's had really poor finishing. But if you look at his career, he's met his XG quite consistently. So in theory, the numbers back up him to be a fairly good finisher or at least finish the chances he gets. The one thing is Kai Havertz gets an insane amount of chances. So that translates into an insane amount of goals. Now... Do I think kind of in the future he's somebody that becomes this clinical monster? No. I don't think he's ever going to become somebody that's going to be like a one-chance goal type of player. I don't think he is that. Um, And that's why I think, for me, you have to ask him to kind of play as part of a front two. And I do see him really exploding with maybe a different type of profile nine. Like when I look at it, how can he operate in the Kevin De Bruyne role with Holland? I think he'd excel in that role. And I do think that that's something Mikel is looking for down the line. But until he does that, there is a little bit of work that he has to do in terms of dealing with contact from behind. And I think over the weekend, people got really encouraged for his ability to kind of bring down some long balls and, you know, and integrate people into play. I still think he has some work to do pinning the center backs. Like, I think there was two really great examples of what he was able to bring others into play, but I still don't think he pinned Ruben Diaz and got him out. You know, I think there's a little bit more work to be done there, but um, he definitely gives us an option to go long from a press, right? And I think that um, for me, whether that's as a midfielder coming up to do that or starting as a false nine, they're both very similar in terms of what you ask for them to do. I just think long-term, he is going to be paired with our long-term number nine, And you're going to see Martin Odegaard slowly move deeper into this team as opposed to higher up the pitch. Um, And I think that's the drawback that we're basically going to see. And we're going to have two 
midfielders here that a operate a little bit deeper in build up and then one that operates a little bit more in the final third both with free rules both with able to kind of do different things but fundamentally you're going to have two that go deep and you know two that kind of go high Mm -hmm. And, and what do you expect for Havertz in his first year? Because I have a sneaky feeling that Havertz will be one of our top goal scorers. Because I see the way Arteta has transformed Odegaard from a creative type of midfielder to 15 goals a season, no penalty. Yeah. And Havertz has got the natural goal scoring instinct, the arrival in the box. That movement is there. And we've seen it in preseason. I think he scored two free goals. Could have scored against Man City, one or two there. I think Havertz will be one of Arsenal's top goal scorers. But what do you expect in terms of numbers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um... I agree with you. I think our system lends itself to somebody attacking the box at the penalty spot, right? Like if you're able to kind of see yourself generate a lot of chances there, I think you're going to succeed. And one of the things is I don't think that Martin Odegaard was necessarily prolific in that regard previously. Like we made him prolific by the amount of chances we offered. And I think Kai Havertz is going to have a very similar level of chance um, available to him. And I think, in my opinion, personally, he has a better base than Martin Odegaard did even to score goals. So I'm with you. I think he'll score a lot of goals. I don't know if he'll be our top goal scorer. I still have a feeling that, you know, Martinelli will finish a lot more chances, as will Saka. Um, but for me, I still see something like 15 Premier League goal and assists in, in terms of his arsenal. And I think that, you know, he's fully capable of doing that. Um, you know, the, the, the issue becomes, um, do you see him kind of split minutes between that and the cup competitions a little bit more? Is he necessarily a starter? Because if you asked me, is he a starter, then I could see those numbers being hit. Um, but I think realistically, I'm looking at anything from 10 to 15 Premier League goals and assists next season. Um, but if he was a starter, I'd say 15. Mm -hmm. And do you think he's, you mentioned earlier about starting lineup? Does he get into our starting lineup when everyone's fully fit and available? Because obviously, right now Jesus is injured, so he can play as a striker. But when Jesus is available, you expect him to come into the team and have that front three again. Then a midfield of Rice and Partey and Odegaard. Do you think Havertz can break into that first team? Well, I think he can, but then you start to ask yourself, I mean, who was our best player of preseason? And it was Trossard, if I'm really being fair, yeah, like bar Bakayo Saka. And so it starts to think, like, are there scenarios where you can fit these players in starting 11s? Of course there is. But in terms of actual output, again, this Arsenal team is going to be ruthless, mate. Like, he has to outcompete these players to deserve the spot. I don't want to just give it to him. And I think just because you spent this amount of money doesn't guarantee your position as a starter. Um, I think he's going to have to be clinical, and he has to kind of complete the final action. We can't just keep relying on potential if we're going to say you're a starter in this team. And I think that's been the standard. I mean, Trossard comes on again, and he, he looks it's a deflected goal, but he still makes a decisive action and I think he's been that in all of preseason in fact I would argue and I'd, I'd throw it back to you what does Trossard have to do more to start over Kai Havertz especially on the sample that you've had so far but also in this team generally because for me he's been again our best player of preseason the only thing I'd say about Havertz is that different aspect he offers in terms of that target man frame. And we saw it against yeah. City, that out ball is always there. And Trossard's a bit obviously more diminutive. So when you go for that type of that player, especially when you've got Raya coming into the team potentially, you're going to have that long ball constantly on. And the way that Arsenal play, you want to have different styles. And sometimes in these big games, I think specifically, Havertz does turn up. Havertz has got a good you know history against Man City in the Champions League final. So I think you know it's a good question to have and it's a good problem to have as well. To have so does Trossard, Trossard ironically. And Havertz, yeah, Trossard, exactly. Trossard and Havertz there's a lot of players there Smith Rowe and Vieira off the bench Arsenal have very good depth and now looking at the Arsenal bench I'm actually going okay he can come on now he can come on and there's, also, and there's, there's players that fans yeah. can actually get excited about rather than being at the Emirates I had a, and, I had a post about exactly that earlier and I was going to actually ask you like really quickly have you even gone through the exercise of trying to define our bench because you've got nine spots oh. and I struggle even with David Rea coming in and you know I, I kind of pose this question and you know I, I think people are not realizing we will be missing one or two players guaranteed yeah that are of top, top quality. And, you know, I think that's an amazing thing to have kind of in our bench, A. And, and, but B, it does place a lot more confusion in the starting 11 because I'm sitting there saying, I don't even know my depth, let alone no. my starting 11. No, I also have a really big squad. And it's a good problem to have because often in the past, you've been, you've had like maybe three, four, five good players. The rest have just been average players. Now also yeah. we've got a lot of players. And you saw it, I think I saw it more than ever when Arsenal was celebrating after the community showed and everyone's just running over. And I'm like, oh, he's class and he's class and he's good as well. And he, <laughs> uh, it is a really good problem to have. But Thanks for checking out the Canon Podcast. To get full episodes and access to exclusive benefits, head over to patreon.com forward slash the Canon Pod and sign up for just £3 a month.